Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, a webinar on uh, advances in cataract surgery and uh, and uh, we have the galaxy of uh, speakers who are experts in the field of uh, attraction. Sorry. There is something wrong. Sorry for uh, this uh, technical issue. Uh, so a very good evening to all of you. I welcome you all on behalf of Iskaris in this uh, 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 session on uh, advances in cataract surgery, wherein experts in the field of cataract surgery are going to present some very interesting videos. Uh, we have with us uh, our president uh, of Iskaras, Professor J.S. Tidyal, who is also the chief of our center and uh, expert in the field of uh, cataract surgery. He is, he is my teacher and has taught many, uh, many students in the, in the area of I think Rajesh has a net issue, I think. Oh. <clears throat> I think we are missing him. <laughs> anyway, I think, uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, and I think uh, until he comes back, uh, we've been having a, a series of uh, cataract and cataract related uh, uh, you know, webinars basically looking into uh, surgical tips, basics to complex. And today also we are going to have uh, a complex situations. And the uh, very importantly, the masters are going to tell us the tips and tricks of uh, managing these difficult situations. Looking into our uh, society journey for last, you uh, know, in the COVID time, Dr. Rajesh and team has done a wonderful work in establishing Fridays for uh, you know, learning for uh, all our members. And that has gone, uh, I think, very nicely amongst the viewers. Like they really appreciate the efforts taken by Rajesh, especially for uh, basic things, investigations, discussions, case presentations. They have really uh, lined up the entire uh, you know, gamut of uh, basic ophthalmology for last few, one year or so. So today, again, I think we will discuss on a cataract point of view. Rajesh can take over and we can start with the first speaker. Just a very uh, brief about uh, the speakers who are with us today. Uh, director and senior consultant, uh, uh, at, in the cataract and refractive surgery services at Metralium, Kolkata. Dr. Suresh Pandey, who is director in chief institute and uh, LASIK Laser Center at Kota. Uh, we have with us Dr. Saurav Patwardhan, who is consultant cataract and vitreoretina services at uh, Nanda Deep Eye Hospital, Sangli, Maharashtra. We have Dr. Jaspreet Sukheja, who is professor in pediatric cataract services at Advanced Eye Center, PGI Chandigarh. 
We have with us Dr. Arun Shetrapal, who is Director and Senior Consultant, Cataract and Refractive Surgery Services at Shetrapal Hospital and Jumeir. Dr. Subhash Prasad, who is Director and Senior Consultant, Cataract and Refractive Surgery Services at Devedrishti Eye Center, Patna. Dr. G.S. Dhami, who is Director and Senior Consultant, Cataract and Refractive Surgery Services at Dhami Eye Care Hospital. Ludhiana, Dr. Purinder Bhasin, who is founder, director, and senior consultant in the cataract and refractive surgery services at Ratan Jyoti Mitrale Gwalior, and Dr. Sharad Babu, who is founder, director, and senior consultant, cataract and refractive angle. We begin the proceedings with our first speaker, who is uh, uh, Dr. Sagar Bhargava, who will be talking about cataract surgery in, in, uh, in a nano slides, please. I think. Yeah. The Pasagar can you yeah, share yeah, 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 I'm yeah. yeah. Is my slide visible? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, at the outset, good evening to everyone and uh, a special thanks to Dr. Rajesh for this uh, invitation. Uh, and so I'll be speaking on cataract surgery in nanophthalmos. So the word, the moment we hear nanophthalmos, the, all of us start thinking about the problems that can happen in nanophthalmos. And we'll all agree that is one of the most difficult and challenging situations to really, for any sur cataract surgeon to begin with. Small eye, crowded anterior chamber, thick lenses, uh, very, and then literature has shown us that there has n number of complications that can happen, right from aqueous misdirection on table, to PC, very high risk of PC rent, zonal dialysis, so many things can happen. Uh, but uh, with regard to the approach of nanophthalmos, uh, it's, it's, it's divided. So now with the advances in phacomulsification, there is a group which advocates a pure phacomulsification approach with uh, titration of the parameters and, uh, and uh, don't do anything else. And uh, then there is another approach which uh, tells us to do a sclerectomy with sclerotomy or phacomulsification with Pure sclerotomy. Now, the second approach uh, has been validated from a study from Arvind uh, in 2017, which was published in EGO, which they, where they clearly showed that the group which underwent sclerectomy actually had lesser uh, incidence of uh, uh, post op events, especially the uveal effusion. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you two cases which uh, deals with this approach. So, I'm not going to give any verdict which one is better, which one is not better. But uh, I'll just show, share with you the two approaches as to how do we go about if we, have, if we choose the second approach. So let's begin with this case. This is a typical nanophthalmic eye. You can have, you can see the axial length of around 15.67 with with uh, uh, till, a thick lens, and uh, it has a retinal scale thickness of about 1.9 millimeters. This has to be measured on ultrasound, preoperative ultrasound is must, as a, that will establish the diagnosis of nanophthalmos. Anterior chamber depth is expected to be low. And uh, the IL power was 55. Now, in this uh, case, we used the approach which was described by Dr. Martin Wax way back in 1992, published in Journal of Glaucoma. Here, essentially, you do a lamellar resection, uh, uh, lamellar resection to create a five by five millimeter of uh, sclera, uh, superficial scale fab, excise it, and in the bed, you make a V-shaped cut, and the apex of the V is then, uh, then excised. And, and uh, so this is the case of before uh, taking up such cases, a pre-op panitol is a must because this will dehydrate the vitreous and uh, reduce the intraocular pressure. And uh, this is how the case goes. So basically in this case, we performed uh, uh, four quadrant sclerectomy with sclerotomy. And uh, to start with all the four uh, uh, extraocular muscles were tagged. And th this is how we are uh, um, making a five, uh, four or five millimeter, uh, four by four millimeters uh, superficial scales flap, about two millimeters from the limbus. And uh, you are uh, basically about half, half thickness uh, of sclera, you are resetting it and excising it. And in the bed, as you can see, now I'm going to make a V. The apex of the V is about two millimeters from the apex of the square. So approximately it's four millimeters from the limbus and uh, and uh, you go as deep as possible so that the choroid is exposed. And now you can appreciate how thick is the sclera. So you have to really struggle to get to the bed of the sclera and that's where you actually excise the, the apex. Now the same thing is done on the other quadrant. I'm just forwarding it. And uh, 
here the same thing is done and again the apex uh, the v is created and then the apex of the v is excised so you can see the parallel thing there and uh, then you start the surgery the surgery itself is quite challenging because most of the times this cases have small pupils shallow anterior chamber here we are using intracranial adrenaline and uh, one of the keys here is that you need to use uh, a good uh, viscoelastic substance probably a high viscous dispersive uh, viscoelastic substance would be a key something like a discovisc or a, or a, a viscoidopic substance like elon 5 uh, whichever is available so here uh, the study uh, is going uh, a routine and uh, you are thinking it tackle the important point here is not to allow the chamber to uh, to collapse a frequent viscoelastic uh, injection is important these these guys are also having higher risk of endothelial damage so you have to keep injecting the elastic and and try to do the 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 fake muscle uh, as away from the, uh, the endothelium as possible but it's always difficult so the viscous elastic has a very very important role in these cases so here we are putting a 40 adapter uh, uh, single piece lens and uh, the and uh, you can see how big the lens looks the moment it comes out of the thing and then the the surgery is terminated uh, been completed by switching the penning lever so this patient uh, post op course was uh, in, uh, uneventful but what is important to note that in spite of four quadrant sclerotomy with sclerotomy patient still had choroidal effusion which eventually cleared in four weeks and patient see the visual acuity of 6 by 24 with this refraction now this is the post op picture this is a picture after 10 years post surgery the surgery was done about 10 years back but i wanted to look at the other eye the other eye had a sis is done elsewhere and this patient uh, had a pmm lens implanted in the cell gas so you can make out that the lens has actually uh, there is a optic capture there and eventually this lens uh, tilted and caused a corneal decompensation patient had an infection and ultimately the eye was lost due, uh, and the patient had an evisceration so the key point here is that sis uh, probably is not a very good idea to do in such cases because fake emulsification gives a much much better control coming to the second case this had a this patient had a 17.3 mm axial length and you can see the scale thickness and every parameter kind of shows that this is a narrowstomic eye now this uh, is a slightly different way of doing sclerectomy so here we are choosing only one quadrant uh, sclerectomy sclerotomy so we have chosen the inferior nasal quadrant so same intra extraocular muscles are attacked and uh, just forwarding it and i'll show you the the thing same uh, calculation about 2 mm from the limbus we go ahead and create the the 4 by 4 mm uh, scheduled flap and uh, and basically dissect it out and in the bed you essentially create uh, a small uh, block of uh, uh, deep skeletal tissue this is about 2 by 2 mm just like what you do in a trap you have to be very careful in this maneuver because you don't want to go very deep you have to slowly uh, uh, dissect it and in a very gradual controlled way you basically excise this block so this is how we are uh, removing the deep deep uh, scale block and you are exposing that area the supracortical space so that whatever you will diffusion happens gets drained from this area so this is how the drainage is uh, this is completed and we suture this in this case we have not excised the flap we have just sutured it and then we proceeded with the surgery as usual i'm not going to go into details here only difference was i used irisox to do the do my surgery so surgery per se there is not much uh, to show here so the same standard 40 adapter lens was implanted and uh, this patient luckily had uh, no choroidal effusion developed a good visual like uh, had a good visual outcome at the end and the refraction was also acceptable so i would say to conclude that the, the patient should have a, a pre a, 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 these kind of cases a pre operative investigation of ultrasound is must because you need to look at the retinochoroidal still thickness also sometimes these patients may have uh, pre existing effusion which probably would need drainage as a first stage and then do a second second stage surgery a pre op manitol is absolutely necessary in these cases and sclerotomy sclerotomy definitely can be considered in the short extremely short eyes 14 15 16 mm of uh, axial length use of appropriate viscoelastic cannot be overemphasized and one should always avoid nth chamber collapse in these cases and, and very important is if you get a sudden shallowing of nth chamber and and the intraoperative high iop always suspect of sub, 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 supracortical hemorrhage and and close the eye as soon as possible this this is a definitely 
a possible team be size so this is what i wanted to present thank you so much for your kind attention thank you dr sagar sagar for yeah. uh, presenting a very you know interesting topic uh, uh tyas sir would like to make uh, any comments on this it was a uh, beautiful demonstration of uh, you know i think one of the most difficult uh, challenging uh, both would be there in such cases especially uh, actually in less than 17 mm and chances of all these complications are very very high and uh, he showed uh, the advantage of very small incision surgeries a uh, fake way is always advantageous uh, in such situations and the surgery sometimes can be very tough in these cases and you do require a drainage sometimes but one of the important aspect of these cases is uh, getting a appropriate iol power and the calculation can also be challenging sometimes but uh, if you use a standard iwas if refraction adds uh, in second case are a uh, very comfortable refraction if we can achieve that uh, people do have a very advantages uh, Uh, of a cataract surgery sometimes we may have to do in a like a clear lens extraction in these patients because they are so deprived of a good uh, you know uh, visual acuity in these scenarios with the experience of fake surgery in a small eye you can do surgery early enough in these patients also and the surgery should be quick and fast that is what we have learned uh, with from our teachers also all these nanothermic eyes small uh, excellent eyes surgery should be as fast as possible But in our days, it's to be a large incision surgery, and these complications are very, very high. You know, effusion and uh, shallow chamber, lens extruding, or vitreous coming out. Uh, but things are uh, much better now. But uh, both the cases very nicely handled. Any issue? Best uh, way to calculate the IOL power in such cases. Direct will be sufficient, or you need something else? Uh, I think what whichever I help formula you take is going to be tough in these cases to come to the accurate power calculation, and the standard uh, uh, formula that doesn't work out in these cases. Barrett also, I'm not very sure how effective it is less than seventeen millimeter of axial length. There are many people uh, do I you know on table refraction sometimes to see what will be the power, and uh, I know that some surgeon do I you know. Standard uh, implantation of uh, ranging from thirty-four to forty diopter lenses, which may be available. Then think of a secondary implantation subsequently, sulcoflex, which can be calculated much better way, and then you can correct the entire power. Because most of the time the power uh, goes from a forty-five to sixty diopter in these cases, and the uh, lenses can be manufactured from uh, IO care especially. But these lenses, the optics are so uh, we can say uh, compromised because thick lenses and vision thick. never comes out very good. It's always better to put a standard available lenses of a better optics than go for a you no know, secondary implantation of a sulcoflex. Any any role of uh, just wondering because of these thick lenses, uh, which can you know push the iris uh, interiorly. Any role of PI in these cases? yeah so so most of these patients tend to have angle closure to start with actually so the cases which i showed actually had pi done before a yak pi actually so uh, any none of them guy there is should be a very high index for angle closure so almost around 50, if i'm not wrong around 50 to 60 percent patients actually have angle closure disease in these patients and they tend to do well actually what sir was telling that early cataract removal actually would benefit these patients and they will you know that will prevent development of an angle closure glaucoma So PI definitely can be done. Yeah, otherwise, you know, I've seen patient having a total, you know, peripheral anterior sciatica formation because chamber gets slower and slower, shallower in these cases. Even the young iridotomy people do can cause uh, endothelial damage because it's so narrow in Correct. the periphery and crowded. So I think with the uh, better surgical techniques now, it's we should always aim for early surgery for these patients. Yeah, Rajesh, okay. we can go to second so, talk. Thank you, Dr. Sagar, and we move on to our thank next speaker. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we have Dr. Suresh Pandey who will be talking about handling black diamonds. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Titiyal, sir. 
and Dr. Ayesh Chena uh, for inviting me to participate in this uh, talk today. And uh, is it my presentation is clear? Which one? Yes, sir. Yes. yes sir. Yeah. So uh, today I'm going to talk about the uh, black cataract management of black cataract. As we all know that the phaco emulsification in black cataract was once uh, considered uh, a contraindication for phaco emulsification in the beginning era. But now we have tools and technology to manage uh, the black cataract. And uh, it's very important uh, that before uh, taking these cases for phaco emulsification, uh, the cases should be uh, seen in detail. The present should be discussed in detail. The counseling should be done. And uh, we should discuss about all possible complications uh, which can happen in uh, managing these cases. Uh, it's very important to perform the specular uh, corneal endothelial cell count uh, to know the status of the cornea. These can ultrasound should be done. And it's very important to explain the, all the possible complications such as uh, the post capsule rent, uh, rent or uh, nucleus drop and need for the another uh, cataract surgery. Also, the patient should be explained and discuss uh, the need for conversion of the uh, 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 techniques such as ECC or, uh, you know, uh, while doing phaco emulsification. The surgeon should use uh, his or her preferred technique, which can be SICS for phaco emulsification. Uh, so, once uh, we, uh, we evaluate the case thoroughly and phaco emulsification uh, is uh, the case is taken for phaco emulsification. There are several, uh, you know, unique aspects about the uh, phaco emulsification of white uh, or black cataract. First of all, it's very important to uh, stain the anterior lens capsule with the type in blue dye. Staining is very important in such cases to perform a good, well sized capsule axis. One should aim for slightly bigger capsular axis such as 5.5 millimeter uh, to 6 millimeter in size. 5.5 millimeter axis can be uh, adequate. Uh, it's very important to rotate the nucleus uh, clockwise, anti-clockwise, uh, and uh, so that the cortical capsule additions can be loosened up. And one of the most important aspects is the use of conductive sulfate-based viscoelastic, such as viscoat, to protect the endothelium. And while doing hydrodissection, uh, it's very important to avoid the, uh, uh, the capsular lenticular block, uh, which can happen in such cases. Uh, one, the surgeon should use uh, the, uh, the, uh, the sharp uh, chopper uh, so that, uh, you know, the, it's very uh, uh, feasible to do vertical chop using sharp chopper. And uh, once, uh, uh, you know, you do the vertical chop, then uh, you can use the blunt chopper subsequently while uh, removing the fragments of the, uh, of the uh, nucleus. And it's very important to, uh, to use the viscoat uh, while removing the last fragment uh, so that you can uh, avoid minimize the, the post capsule rent. So these are the important tips for, for managing the black cataract, use of the uh, sharp chopper, use of the uh, triprin blue dye, and use of the conductive sulfate based viscoelastic. And now uh, I'm going to show uh, another case uh, of uh, hard cataract with uh, a small pipil. And this case uh, uh, was uh, on tamsulosin hydrochloride for uh, benign prostate hyperplasia. And uh, while doing uh, capsular access, uh, the people, I noticed that people uh, is uh, you know, coming down. And uh, I used, uh, I decided to use the malignant ring. Ideally, the malignant ring should be used uh, at the, uh, before doing capsular access, but I made a mistake. Uh, I thought that I will manage uh, with the viscometriasis technique, but uh, the, the people came down, so I decided to use malignant ring uh, after doing capsular access. And uh, any pupillary uh, expansion devices such as the malignant ring or water charging ring or iris hooks should be used before doing capsular access. And one should plan in such a way that uh, if there's a case of uh, the floppy iris syndrome with heart cataract, it can further uh, increase the difficulty for surgeon. So these um, uh, devices should be used uh, without any problem you know, or without any hesitation. Once uh, you uh, remove the cataract, then uh, after using the uh, people expansion devices, the, the case becomes fairly easy. And then you can perform the uh, critical multiplication, irrigation, aspiration, and uh, iron implantation. And once uh, the IOL is implanted, then you can use uh, the 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 pupillary expansion device, uh, such as malignant ring, is shown in this case. 
and uh, it's very important uh, to plan these cases uh, beforehand and to uh, make sure that uh, you have the device and all the ancillary uh, uh, you know uh, devices uh, beforehand once you take up these cases coming to the third case uh, of the cataract nigra with the jonla dehiscence this is a case of uh, black cataract uh, with the jonla dehiscence from 3 to 4 or 5 o'clock hours and uh, this case i did a couple of years ago sometimes uh, we do see uh, such cases uh, which are uh, difficult because of the uh, black cataract with the additional complications such as jonla dehiscence and then you may high risk of uh, nucleus drop if not managed properly so in this case uh, what i did i just uh, perform capsular access and then I uh, uh, use the CPR capsule uh, attention ring. And if the uh, journal dehiscence is more than five clock hours, then one can go for the CON ring. In this case, this was a traumatic cataract with the journal uh, dehiscence was three to four o'clock, uh, three to five o'clock hours. So uh, we use the simple CPR and the, the, uh, the CON ring can be uh, helpful if there is a more uh, journal dehiscence, more than five o'clock journal dehiscence is there. And one should be very gentle uh, while doing fake emulsification. Uh, use copious amount of viscoelastic such as viscoat uh, to coat the endothelium. The capsule, uh, uh, the support system can be used to support the uh, the capsular edge uh, and to uh, avoid uh, the the descent of the nucleus while doing fake emulsification. Uh, always use low FECO uh, power to the parameters and uh, just be gentle with the uh, uh, while doing FECO multiplication. And once we use the CTR, the capsule support system and the copious uh, dispersive scholastic, the case uh, went very well. And the nucleus multiplication was done, this was followed by the irrigation aspiration and uh, cortical cleanup. And then uh, we implanted the uh, PP syntocular lens into the capsular bag. So sometimes with black cataract can uh, can uh, pose the additional complications such as uh, the small pupil or zonal adhesions. Uh, and one the surgeon should be very careful while managing such cases. It's very important to uh, to stream the uh, lens capsule use. Uh, uh, frequent coating of the coronal endothelium is very important to minimize the endothelial cell loss. Uh, use the type of blue dye and uh, avoid airflow lenticular block and always uh, uh, use sharp chopper uh, to uh, and uh, to, uh, burst mode or pulse mode and uh, the femtosecond laser can be helpful uh, as it can help to minimize the FECO energy and it can also helpful to uh, perform the uh, good size capsule axis. So once uh, um, we follow the all the, uh, the, the tips uh, the case uh, uh, you know, can be managed uh, well, and then you know, we can uh, we, we can seal the incision. And I always use the pituitary uh, you know, time zone uh, in uh, and uh, the moxifloxacin to minimize the post-operative inflammation and infection. So this is the uh, uh, last case of uh, the fecomulsification dense cataract. Sometimes, uh, if they get uh, poor endothelial cell count or small pupil, or in cases where they get general dehiscence, uh, the surgeon can convert uh, uh, to ECC or surgeon can plan. Or small people or jolla dehiscence, then a small incision cataract surgery can be uh, can be good tool to manage such cases. And uh, this is a case of uh, uh, dense cataract uh, where fish hook technique is used to deliver the the nucleus, the bulky nucleus. And this technique can be helpful uh, to uh, to minimize the endothelial cell loss and to uh, to uh, uh, deliver the nucleus without any complication. And here, uh, the preview lens is uh, being planted. Nowadays, uh, the SICS can be done uh, through much smaller incision. And for course, surgeon to, to really follow the technique which is helpful for, for to manage uh, dense cataract. So the take home message is always counsel these cases for preoperative evaluation is very important. And always use FECO chalk technique with burst mode or pulse mode. 
and use of the quaternary sulfate based viscoelastic very important uh, and always always uh, manage such cases to minimize the complication and never hesitate to convert to ecc or always you can uh, go ahead with the your preferred technique to manage such cases thank you so much thank you dr suresh for uh, uh, discussing a very difficult scenario uh, black cataracts so can you just unshare the slide yeah thank you thank you so, any comment from any of the panelists yeah sir Uh, what I, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, carry on, carry on. So what I feel is that the posterior plate in these uh, dark nucleus is in, is very leathery and very tough. So as Dr. Pandey had rightly shown that you need to separate those uh, these uh, posterior plates, then only you get a good uh, crack and you get a good uh, uh, segments, which will be very easy to emulsify. So the uh, one point should uh crack the posterior plate then only you will be able to emulsify further uh, dr Just... arun there is very very important point uh, you uh, rightly mentioned that uh, it's very important to crack the leathery separate the leathery uh, plate and it's uh, like you know breaking the bone of the cataract backbone of the cataract right thank you so what is the role of uh, excuse me dr tikal can i ask one question ask you, you need it, yeah Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, this um, what I was uh, saying that um, while cracking, while chopping, crater chop uh, or uh, that will decrease the. Margin. No, no, absolutely correct. Uh, what you said, I think whatever method we use, the uh, important thing was uh, Arun was talking about to really, you know, separate at least two pieces to begin with. If you achieve that, your surgical time decreases and you can uh, very easily complete this surgery. The problem uh, comes up when we have a you know peripheral choth but central never gets separated because so black leathery cataract. Whatever amount of pressure you uh, divide, it doesn't get uh, you know uh, divided into halves. Then you have to play with uh, all those tricks, keep eating out the peripheral areas, and try to have a smaller piece in the center. Sometimes uh, in these difficult cases, what I do towards the uh, end, I normally cushion out the posterior part with a you know discoat or a dispersive viscoelastic. Then go with the you know fake handpiece right in the middle. And make a you know uh, eat in the right in the center. Like lift little bit and eat in the center. That will uh, complete your division sometimes. So those tricks have to be played in these cases because sometimes amount of force required to separate two pieces are too much. You know, sometimes it can cause dialysis. Like the third case you showed was uh, you know subluxated cases. There it is very difficult. So many people nowadays will get into different modes. Femtosecond laser, as you rightly pointed out, the capsular excess part will be done. But uh, nucleus, uh, the current generation femtosecond has no role in the nucleus in such a black cataract. I I think I've seen one or two videos uh, where people are use my loop that can really bisect the nucleus uh, in such cases if you have a good capsular bag. So that can be one handy tool in uh, absolutely you know Niagara type of cataract. Otherwise, other cataracts we can manage very, very effectively, and the soft shell technique is, you know, I think one of the saviors. If possible, we should in keep injecting dispersive viscoelastic in middle also. There are some surgeons they keep, uh, you know, uh, cut off. If your uh, CDA exceeds fifteen, inject once. It uh, it exceeds another ten, inject once more. So that type of guidance can be made. But you have to be careful that uh, it doesn't, you know, increase the heat. Sometimes, emulsifying this uh, dispersive viscoelastic can really be, uh, you know, heat producing also. But whatever said and done, these cases are very difficult, very difficult on table also, and next day also, cornea can be white sometimes, and patient keep asking you, "What has happened to my eye?" 
So you have to wait for next six to eight weeks to tell them that things will be all right. But Desmond attachment and that should also be looked after in a post-op period. Dr. Tetyal sir, uh, did you have experience of using Akasi pre-chopper in the cases? No, no, no. I am okay. a very, very you know conservative uh, person. I'm, I have not used all other devices. Milo, Milo. Milo was tried in one or two uh. cases, but I didn't find uh, as comfortable because okay, sir. I found it is to be you uh, know difficult to go through the large nucleus through the back. In smaller nucleus, good hydro delineation, it works fantastically. But larger nucleus there, I, as Arun said, I normally do a central deep bulking, make a thick crater and uh, then chop it. Yes, sir. Amit, sir. Uh, so you have to unmute yourself. Uh, muted. You unmute, unmute, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's yeah. an excellent presentation, but uh, I I agree with Dr. Titya. It's better to be conservative than aggressive. Make a good crater, debulk the nucleus. And once you have a bad board one, all difficult cases where your surgery goes uh, quite a long, you know, these cases will take at least you know 60, 70 CD sometimes, and the inflammation will be bound to be there in these cases. So we need to really assess the macula of these cases also. And the inflammatory has to be uh, you know, uh, given for a long time. CME can be a major factor in these cases, which sometimes silently goes because we focus on to cornea and inflammation. We don't think of macula as cases. So that part should also be looked after. Uh, TTR, sir, TTR, sir, is there any role of CHIT BSS in these cases? You know, as uh, Dr. Dami also said, I am very conservative. I've never used these tricks. So we we want a normal you uh, know temperature BSS. Chill BSS, I'm not sure how effective it will be, because ultimately once it goes to the anterior chamber, it takes in the you know the uh, the uh, temperature of the you know anterior chamber immediately. So chill beer will be there for some time for a surgeon rather than a patient. You know, you chill after uh, your surgery. Rajesh, can I add a point? Yeah, sure. Sir. Uh, uh, once you come yes, to sir. the last fragment. It is better to take out the second hand, means the chopper or anything that prevents the excessive leakage on the wound. And when you handle with the only FACO hand piece, it's very easy to handle and you are safe from the endothelium and your PC is very safe. That's a very good point. Very good point, yeah, sir. Good sometimes we use, you know, if, if you're using a Centurion or an Infinity type of system where you have a combined uh, uh, longitudinal and torsional. In such cases, you should, uh, know, because IP, once you run it, it's going to have, you know, few pulses going. Uh, so after. Our next speaker, who is going to present a unique scenario, uh, FACO in eyes with eccentric pupil. So let's see Dr. Saurabh Patwadhan what he has to show in this. Uh... Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for the invitation and it's a pleasure to present in front of my teachers. And uh, I have learned from Dr. Titial, sir, and Rajesh, sir, in my PG as well as senior residency. So uh, here is an interesting case. Uh, and uh, this particular patient is mother of two ophthalmologists. So I think uh, it was a unique, uh, uh, I would say, responsibility given to me to operate on this case. So I will just uh, run. Uh, just let me know if the audio is uh, there. This video is intended for education and training of eye surgeon. Viewer discretion is advised, not recommended for children. 
हेलो फ्रेंड्स आई एम डॉक्टर सौरभ पटवर्धन फ्रॉम नंदा दीपा ट्रेनिंग सेंटर इन दिस वीडियो आई बी डीलिंग विथ अ केस ऑफ एक्सट्रीमली एक्सेंट्रिक पीपल विथ कैट्रैक्ट सो दिस वॉज द प्रेजेंटेशन पेशेंट इज अ सिक्स इयर ओल्ड फीमेल एनेस्थेटिस बाय प्रोफेशन शी हैड हिस्ट्री ऑफ चाइल्डहुड ट्रॉमा एंड सिंस देन हर विजन इज सब नॉर्मल अराउंड ट्वेंटी बाय सिक्सटी and now there is further deterioration of the vision because of uh, formation of cataract and as you can see here the pupil is strikingly eccentric as it is dragged into the previous injured sclera so there are a few issues to deal with here the first of all biometry was not possible in undilated pupil as the optical center was covered with iris so we did dilated biometry and it showed astigmatism in the cornea so we needed torical to correct the astigmatism and of course the most striking thing here was the extremely eccentric pupil so let's start thinking i'll be using isox to do phaco emulsification with torical and of course i have to do pupilloplasty now how will i bring the pupil to the center one option is to cut the pupil on one side with scissors or use vitrectomy probe or something which can spare the sphincters because either with vitrectomy probe or by scissors the sphincters are going to be damaged and we may be having a dilated pupil in the post operative period so the first part was to mark the cornea for the torical placement and then i'll be using two iris hooks to retract the iris and then after retracting the iris the pupil is dilated enough for doing phaco emulsification phaco emulsification was done using stop and chop method i am taking extra precautions here to spare the posterior capsule because i don't want to complicate things further and uh, i am implanting toric iol and trying to place it on the axis as far as possible before removing the ovd from the bag but i will be injecting 1.8% sodium hyaluronate in the anterior chamber at the end so that i can do the pupilloplasty procedure first i tried to release this iris from the incarcerated site it was not possible and you can see this is the center optical center of the eye which is covered by the iris even in partially dilated state so the next step is to make this pupil more central so i am going to use a unipolar diathermy with linear energy and the heat produced here is going to cause shrinkage of the collagen of these radial fibers and it is going to retract this iris from the center so you can watch here how i am carefully using unipolar diathermy which we commonly use for retinal surgeries i have seen this technique being used by dr sergio canabrava and now you can see the optical center is uncovered the iris is dragged on one side and uh, i have marked the optical center now with that blue dot and you can see that i'm further using the diathermy to shrink the iris away from the center till i feel it is adequate enough once the diathermy is done after that i'll be doing single pass fourth row pupilloplasty here using 90 proline and using the standard rail roading technique and the loop is taken out using 25 gauge forceps and then i pass four throws of the cut end of the suture through this loop followed by pulling the two ends of the thread using macpherson to reduce the iris defect on one side i'll be adding one more suture in the periphery to cover the gap and now i am going to remove the ovd from the anterior chamber and now i am trying to check the position of the torical just dragging the iris on one side and checking the final position of the iol i am well satisfied at the end with the outcome and this is immediately post operative next day you can see the pupil is well centered and this is after one month 
and pupil is very well centered pupil is of adequate size not unnecessarily dilated there is no iris atrophy or pigment dispersion the great thing is patient achieved uncorrected visual acuity of 20 by 20 from the point where we started and what we achieved in this particular case was really good and very satisfying for more such videos okay thank you it was really very satisfying and very wonderful surgery sort of thank you sir. and thank uh, you. Uh, any comment from And Dr. Swarup, uh, yeah. is there any yeah, evidence of using uh, diathermy can cause uh, some coronal endothelial cell loss? Uh, not particularly here. Of course, oh. I had used it under the uh, hyaluronate. Okay. So, I don't. only concern I had was whether it will cause uh, depigmentation of the iris in that area. Uh, so, luckily, it has not happened. And even there was no chaffing later. So, <laughs> now it's one and a half years uh, back, which I operated. I operated another couple of cases similarly. They are also doing fine. And in fact, I did one case where I did uh, smile after uh, centralizing. So the patient had a refractive error as well as post-traumatic uh, decentered pupil. So I centered the pupil first with pupiloplasty and then did smile. Smile because it didn't require a pupil tracking. So I did smile on that. So uh, this works well. This was initially showed by Dr. Kanabrava in one of uh, his uh, surgeries. So I uh, picked up that idea from there. Great. Excellent. I guess, I guess the energy has to be titrated in such a way that it is not too much yes. and effective as well so that it doesn't cause any atrophy in the iris. Yeah, so it is on linear mode, but of course we can set the, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, basically it is the retinal cautery that uh, we use. Yeah, so yeah. being retina surgeon, we are used to titrating the dose. Can I ask one question? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, so uh, what was, how was the, pu uh, was the pupil dilating fully after the surgery? Because it's being done on the radial muscles, which are the dilator muscles. Yeah. Did it so, the dilatation? Uh, it was not much. It was dilating up to around 5 millimeters. So it was not like fully dilating because I think the pupil was sh uh, shrunk since childhood. So probably the uh, dilating muscles were also not that active. Actually, in such cases, whenever you do the single pass for the pupil plastic, obviously you can't expect a full dilatation in such cases. Yeah. But it, there is a reasonable amount of dilatation through which you can have a look at the fundus. So that is something that is achievable. Yeah. Yeah, Sharad, yeah. you wanted to say something. You had an invitation. Yeah. yeah, do you have any uh, incidents of uh, cautery going through and through and then having a button holding anything like that? No, luckily, no, not so far. <laughs> yes. So, luckily, Indian iris are quite thick, I think. Maybe with uh, depigmented uh, iris, blue iris, we have to be more careful. I have not done any on blue iris. So, maybe next time if I do that, I will definitely report. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Saurav. Thank you, Saurav. We move on to our next speaker, Dr. Jaspreet Sukheja, who is going to present another uh, unique scenario that is pediatric ectopia lentis. Let's uh, listen to him what he has to present. Dr. Dr. Jaspreet, please. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, um, uh, Professor Titial and uh, Dr. Rajesh, uh, for this opportunity. <laughs> of course, uh, you are, it's all adult cataracts, and uh, here I'm presenting something. Uh, something related to cataract, but in pediatric eyes, which are different as when compared to the adult eyes. So um, the indications when we decided that we have to operate in ectopia lentis, uh, a number of indications. And once we've made up our mind that yes, this uh, child needs surgery, probably then there are different ways to go about it. So if you have a, a subluxation, which is uh, less than four clock hours, probably a CTR would do, but as the subluxation increases, a modification in the technique is required. And when it's more than nine clock hours, probably it's uh, better not to use a CTR and go on with a lensectomy and uh, maybe a, uh, uh, an IOL which is fixated either in the iris or a scleral fixated IOL. So uh, I'll be just describe, uh, dis uh, describing three case scenarios here. So these children who come present with ectopia lentis are usually older children. So we have this first one is like an eight year old male 
uh, who's had diminution of vision in both eyes for three years. There's a positive family history. And the best corrected visual is 660 with a minus 10. So this is what we found that uh, the there was superior temporal subluxation of the lens. Uh, there was the zonules were intact and it's almost uh, more nine clock hours of uh, subluxation with iridogenesis in both the eyes. So on general physical exam, 1989, somebody is speaking. Anil, Anil, can you unmute? Uh, can you mute yourself? Admin, can you mute Anil? Yeah. So uh, on general physical examination, I mean, we found that the 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 patient uh, had a diagnosis which was consistent with the Marfan syndrome. So the options with Marfan syndrome because it's a progressive disorder was obviously do a lensectomy and uh, and uh, plan for an IOL implantation, uh, which could be uh, scleral fixated or an iris fixated. ACIOs obviously are out because they are known to have lead to a lot of uh, corneal decompensation. So here what we planned was an iris fixated IOL for uh, reasons because uh, scleral fixated associated with a high risk of retinal detachment in these cases. So after doing a biometry, we planned for an iris iris claw lens, which is a posterior iris claw, which is a single piece PMMA lens uh, with a diameter of eight millimeters and a 5.5 millimeter optic. So this is just a small video that I would be showing. Uh, uh, we don't dilate these pupils nowadays in children with the drops. We use the intracameral uh, phenocaine, the intracameral dilator, which is available. So we just have to put a little about uh, 0.25 ml of it. And you can see here the pupil starts to dilate. So we are routinely using these in children nowadays. So it gives a fairly good dilatation. And after that, uh, we would do a capsule. What we did was a capsorexis uh, followed by uh, the lens matter aspiration. Now the capsorexis is a bit difficult because in the subluxated lens, the, it's a bit tough and it's more elastic rather. It's more elastic. And so one has to be careful when you're doing a rex in these cases. Uh, probably because the zonules are intact, we did not require the capsular hooks. So after doing a rexis, uh, what we did was the lens matter aspiration. So lens matter, because it's a soft cataract, it's it's very quite easy to take out the lens matter. So you can see here an anterior rexis and an empty bag, and we would just remove the bag and do a vitrectomy here, a little bit vitreous, which is there in the, maybe coming onto the anterior part of the eye. So after this, the pupil was constricted using a pilocarpine. And because it's a PMMA lens, we had to made a, make a large incision that's about five millimeters. And then on one side, first to what we did was, uh, sorry, I'll just go back. Yeah, so this is the enclavation which is happening. So it's gone behind the iris. And this is the other part behind the iris, what we are enclaving. So the haptic here has been enclaved into the iris. So this is a posterior iris claw. You can see here, nice round pupil and the main incision was then sutured. So this is how we manage this patient of Marfan syndrome. Of course, he had a, a vision equity of uh, 6 by 24 uh, with just a plus 0.75, which was earlier a minus 10. So this is what we achieved in this patient. And this is the uh, only problem sometimes is the, the consideration with the retinal surgeon because it's a Marfan syndrome, the dilatation and the, the pupil fairly di dilates fairly well to have a good view of the fundus. So this is the anterior OCT, what we are doing probably just to see the clipping where the IOL had clipped here. Uh, and so the main uh, problem in these cases of when you do an iris claw is disenclavation, but in one of the largest series of maybe 320 eyes, the disenclavation rate was just uh, three cases. So probably it's a, it's a reasonably a safe procedure uh, in these eyes where you have uh, children presenting with syndromic uh, subluxations. So uh, these are just some of the studies, but remember that there's no long-term follow-up in these patients with iris claw lenses. So that is what, what is a bit of a concern here. So my case, second patient is a five-year-old male. Again, uh, uh, the subluxation was uh, uh, in, in, the right, in both the eyes, the, the zonules were stretched. The vision was six by 60, and uh, it was a simple ectopia lentis. So here we ruled out other causes of ectopia lentis. In children, it's very important that what, what basically is causing it because the management could differ. So there were seven clock hours of subluxation and here because of the, the amount of subluxation and, uh, and no association with syndrome, we planned for PICO aspiration with a modified CTR and an IOL implantation. So I'll just uh, go on with this. Lens video. implantation under general anesthesia. Sorry. So basically what we were making is scleral pocket as we would made for any patient where we had to plan a scleral fixated IOL. So in the region of the subluxation, 
we had made a pocket and then uh, uh, performing a capsular axis here and uh, taking and basically having doing a lens aspiration so again it's a tough thing here in the in this patient uh, uh, what we did was uh, we did a partial rexis and after doing a partial rexis uh, we stabilized the bag using the the iris hooks so there's one hook and there's the other hook because uh, we had to finally what we have to do is uh, uh, fixate this bag here to uh, in this region in the re in this region here so we had to do use the iris hooks so after removing the lens matter which is not that uh, difficult uh, we used a 10 0 polypropylene we pa passed on from the steel pocket and then uh, bought it out here and then basically what we did was had a ctr uh, tied it to the ctr and implanted the ctr into the bag and the hook and taking care that the hook is in the region of the subluxation so because this bag has to be stretched towards this side. So once this was in the bag, we pulled it out, centered the bag, and closed the scleral flap, and then implanted the foldable IOL. So this was a patient where we had a simple ectopia lentis, and we could easily end up subluxation, which was less than uh, nine clock hours, and we could manage with the CTR and an IOL implantation. So the vision was 624 with minus uh, uh, 7, 0.75. These are amblyopic eyes. So whatever best we could give is uh, <coughs> possible. We should do that. So our case three, that's the last case. Uh, again, a five-year-old with 660 vision. Uh, you can see here the subluxation. Uh, it's in the pu pupillary margin here. Here you can see there's no lens, probably the subluxation much, much more. The other things to find here is that you see this iris, iris pattern here. There's a little corrugation here, but it's flat and thin in the periphery. There's some vitreous membrane, uh, sorry, the pupillary membranes here. So this is not, in, this did not fit into any syndrome. And what we found was a lot of iridodonosis here. You can see here the amount of iridodonosis. This is the subluxation. There are some iris strands here, which you can see. The, the architecture is all disturbed. There is cataract in both the eyes and the pup and the lens is displaced in the opposite direction. It's nasally here, it's nasally as well here. So because it did not have a family history, this did not fit into end of the syndrome probably. It, what we were doing it was, finding was maybe a simple ectopia lentis or an et pupillae. So just, just an anterior OCT findings to see how much the su subluxation was uh, just for documentation. Uh, he was short stature, could we wheel march his knee? So these are the differential in this patient. Ectopia lentis at pupillae, isolated ectopia lentis, or the wheel marchesani. So as I was saying, it's very important to have a cause for the ectopia lentis in children because what management you are going to do is going to differ. So the eco was normal because obviously we were thinking of some syndrome, serum homocysteine levels were more, uh, normal. More than 15 is considered pathognomic. And then a genetic analysis was done for this patient. And when we did a genetic analysis, it came down, it was an autosomal recessive, a gene and this autosomal recessive goes in favor of H. pupillae, which is associated with iris abnormalities, thinning, and atrophy of the iris. Now, because of this thing, we did not plan a posterior iris claw in this patient. What we planned was a scleral fixated. So, I'll just uh, finish my last video here, just a short video. You can see here the subluxation, and we try to uh, have this. So I'm just using it to have a, a 90 degrees apart uh, marks here because I planned it for a Yamane technique here. So again, the ports were made, the various side ports were made. And the rexis was done. The lens was uh, taken, the lens matter was aspirated along with the, with the with, uh, lensectomy was done with the cutter. And a little bit of, of course, a vitrectomy is also done because of the because, because of the vitreous, which is alongside this uh, crystalline lens. So after this is removed, then probably what we did was uh, at about uh, 2.5 millimeters, we did a peritomy here. And after doing a peritomy, what we're doing is we passed a 26K needle. So it's just a modification of the Yamane, what we are doing is, so we are using a 26K needle here. So, just uh, yeah so that's it's moving so just a little uh, tunnel and then go inside behind the iris so you can see here that the needle is going that's coming behind the iris so that's one part and now we're going to do it from the other side as well
Sorry, it's just interrupting. So basically, <laughs> once we've done, once we've implanted the IOL, which is in the sulcus, uh, which we are going on the other side with the 26 kg needle, again, a small talon and just behind the iris. So what we are going to do is the, with the leading hat, haptic, we are going to gradually put it in the bevel of the 26 kg needle. So just going to slow, slowly using the tip, is just being put inside so that it can be just pulled out when the needle is taken out. Just as you would do in when you when we when you have a 10 0 polypropylene suture. But here we have to be careful that it, we do not bend it so much so as to cause a breakage. So once we've uh, maneuvered it inside the 26 gauge needle, we are very slowly taking it out through one of, through the scleral opening here. And then we're going to take the haptic out. So remember, we have to take the haptic out of the needle, not to pull the needle backward. So once the, with this is done properly, then what we did was we had a difficulty in the when uh, with the trailing haptic. So we used the end gripping forceps here, uh, the end gripping vitrectomy forceps. So with that, what we did was just took took the uh, edge and took the tip of the haptic, which is much easier as compared to putting it inside the needle and brought it out on the other side. And after that, of course, so we can see here the blue uh, ha two haptics and then cauterize the end of the haptics and then cover it with the conjunctiva. So this is how we, this is how a genetic analysis helped us in changing that technique of IOL fixation. So with these three cases with different techniques, probably I think uh, one really needs to have a good uh, a cause for uh, ectopia lentis in children. So as to be able to uh, plan the future management. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Jaspreet. And uh, indeed, that was a fantastic collection of very rare cases, uh, which we really don't encounter in our day-to-day -day practices here. I must congratulate you on those uh, lovely and very successful surgeries. I would uh, like to initiate a discussion based on two things. One is, uh, what is your experience on when you're making sterile flats on using reverse Hoffman pockets? And the second uh, thing that I would like to initiate a discussion on is... Uh, the issue of IOL tilt when you're doing a Yamane. So can you address both of them, especially in a child? Yeah, so it's it's difficult here because uh, as I said, I mean, uh, in these patients, especially Marfan, if you try for doing all these things with such an elastic sclera, probably you would have all those issues of IOL tilt. Uh, yes, in these cases also, in the case which I did probably, uh, we did have some issues during the surgery that the IOL was tilting, but uh, yes, with experience probably, uh, if you are, if you are, uh, you can say if those uh, marks are not at 90 degrees, probably the chances are much higher you would have an IOL tilt. So it's very important to have a 90 degrees apart exact measure where you make your incisions. Uh, the other thing is uh, with the Hoffman pockets, uh, yes, uh, I don't uh, routinely now do um, use them in, when, when I'm dealing with the uh, ectopia lentis in children because many of these are, most of them are like Marfan syndrome which are coming to us. So I am preferring a posterior iris claw in these in these patients for uh, for reasons uh, um, like a uh, uh, you know, higher incidence of retinal attachment. Plus you have a it's a progressive disease with a very elastic sclera. So the chances of decentration breakage are much more as compared to uh, if you're if you're probably planning a posterior iris claw. Now, acute uh, uh, acute uh, chances of uh, retinal detachment are also much higher if, because you're dealing with the vitreous base when you're doing a scleral fixated in these patients. So probably. Um, Hoffman pockets for uh, uh, for the other cases are uh, not, I don't have much of experience because the number of cases are done on less, but uh, as such, uh, I did not find any uh, difficulty in making them. Wonderful, I think, just with you have really add, Can I just add one thing, Rajiv? Rajiv, can you hear me? Yes, yes, you can. Actually, I just wanted to add one thing here that, you know, the uh, you showed wonderful techniques to Jaspreet, very nice, and you showed everything like when to do iris claw, when to do spare fixated. So that was wonderful. Uh, uh, I am a little hesitant in doing these iris claw lens in children because uh, uh, so far uh, in three children, uh, I found out that the uh, you know this the, the there was disinclination, and uh, uh, this disinclination happens after maybe six, seven years, because in one child, it was after seven years, in one child, it was after maybe five to six years, something like that. So I'm a bit hesitant. I prefer doing interstitial haptic fixation in children. 
uh, as, uh, if there is uh, no adequate support of capsule. You showed very nice, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the technique of uh, supporting the capsule as well as the Yamane uh, one. And uh, regarding the extreme subluxation of lens, we had published long back one uh, uh, article uh, technique wherein we use made two small uh, openings in the capsule and by use of biomedical irrigation aspiration, the irrigation cannula is used to bring the lens in the center so that under direct visualization you can aspirate the lens matter completely. And it not only hydrates the lens matter but also keeps the lens in the center. And then with the help of the aspirator, you can aspirate. So this is something which uh, uh, we published, uh, I think, uh, about 15, 16 years back. So I just want to add a couple of things here. Yeah, absolutely, I agree with all those. I mean, they're all wonderful techniques which you can use, but it's just that uh, you need to know the cause. I mean, it, one surgery is not for every cause of ectopia lentis. My main point is this, that's it. That you have to know the cause. You right. can't be, right. can't I be agree with you. one versus an isolated ectopia versus a traumatic ectopia and using the same surgical sets. I mean, it's every Absolutely. patient, every pediatric ectopia Absolutely. lentis is different. Perfect. Can, can I add sure. one more word? Sure. sure, sir. These lenses have a very deep interior chamber. You can put a first lens, that is RS claw lens, in the interior chamber, and you will really need it to exchange it when the power then the, as the child grows, you need to exchange it with the exact power needed for the child. At that time, you can do a retrofixation. In any case, it's very difficult to calculate the power in these lenses. And many a times you might require an exchange of the IOL. And exchanging a lens in the interior chamber with a posterior chamber lens is very easy. And we have done it many times. Words of wisdom, Dr. Dhami, I think uh, you have made the point very clear. Uh, and if we can uh, move forward, I think we have Dr. Arun Chetrapal from uh, Ajmer, who's going to talk about one of the nightmares every FACO surgeon faces, that is hypermature cataracts and dealing with the rexes. Dr. Arun Chetrapal, please. Uh, am I visible and audible? Yes, you are. Yes. Can you okay, great. Uh, thank, thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks, Dr. Rajesh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, what I'll be talking about will be very, very basic principles in management of uh, capsular rexes in these wide cataracts. Uh, they may be intumescent, they may be morgagnian types. So uh, recently, we have encountered large number of wide cataracts, basically because of the people postponing their surgery because of COVID and their fear for the coming to the hospital. So basically, there are two uh, challenges in white cataract. One is the capsular excess and another is the nucleus management. So I'll be talking about the capsular excess part. And the, what are the challenges in capsular excess uh, in white cataracts? This is basically the raised intralenticular pressure, which uh, uh, causes the capsular excess to run away to the periphery. So we need to deal with this. And then sometimes the capsule may be fragile and with weak zonules. So you need to be very, very careful while dealing with them. And in some long-standing long -standing cases, the capsule may be calcified or shriveled into a capsule where you need to really cut the capsule uh, to achieve a capsular excess. There's some very helpful tools in this. One is the Tripan Blue, which we all have been using this. A good OVD, an HPMC, or maybe a combination of sodium hyaluronate with chondritin sulfate. Uh, if you are a user of early radio frequency endothermy, you can make use of it, but that is really not required. And of course, femto laser assisted, assisted capsular rexis can also help you if you have this uh, Ferrari standing in your OT. Uh, let's uh, skip the normal case and let's come to this case where I'll be showing you the spiral technique, which is uh, one of my favorite techniques. So what we do is we start with a small nick in the center, raise the flap, make sure that it is not a straight nick, it is slightly curved. So the chances of getting an Argentinian flag sign is less. You start with a small capsular axis. So this is maybe a three millimeter. You can start with a, even a two millimeter axis. 
So once you have achieved a rexus, not a complete one. So at this point of time, what you can do is you can debulk your uh, nucleus. You can debulk your uh, contents of the capsule. So what I'm doing here is I'm sucking out the liquefied cortical matter decreasing the intralenticular pressure. This we need to do it all throughout, not only in one quadrant, but in as many quadrant as possible. So once you have debulked your capsular bag, then you go ahead and increase the size of your rexus in a spiral way. Slowly and slowly, you spiral it out. Now, since you don't, uh, your intralenticular pressure is not raised, so your capsule, capsular excess will behave as you want. So it is necessary to debulk your capsular bag. And once the capsular bag is debulked, there's no raised intralenticular pressure. The capsular excess becomes easy and you can achieve the size what you want. I will uh, skip this and uh, so in the end, if you can appreciate it, that we have been able to achieve a reasonably sized capsular rexus. Coming to the next uh, video. So what you can do is you can make an initial small rexus. debulk your capsular bag and then perform your phaco emulsification and at a later time, once your IOL is inside, you can increase your size of your capsular rexes. So this is what I'm doing. I'm doing a small rexes. This is maybe a four millimeter rexes. Always remember that doing a smaller rexes is much easier than doing a larger rexes. The larger rexes tend to run away to the periphery. So once you have done your phaco emulsification, implanted your lens, now you can increase this the size of this capsular axis. The basic principle what I'm showing you. Once your uh, IOL is inside, you can enlarge your rexus to the desired size. So you can initially make a small rexus and then increase the size of the rexus once you have completed your uh, phaco emulsification. But for this, you would need at least a 4 or 4.5 millimeter rexus size to do your phaco emulsification. Uh, doing a rexus in a smaller, uh, doing your phaco emulsification in a smaller rexus can lead to uh, the rupture of your rexus margins and extension into the periphery. Uh, you can do a capsular bag decompression right at the beginning of your surgery. So what for this, what I do is through a separate uh, place, I make a paracentesis opening with a 26 gauge needle with bevel down, puncture the uh, capsule in the center and then aspirate the cortical matter, as much cortical matter as possible. This decreases the Intralenticular pressure, it decompresses the bag and then subsequent capsular rexus becomes easy. So you have to be very, very stable. And I prefer to use a paracentesis opening rather than going from the main uh, opening. Because going through the main port can lead to decompression of, uh, it can lead to the loss of the viscoelastic and then it can lead to extension of the rexus or error. Argentinian flag sign. In fibrous capsules, uh, it is a bit tricky. You need to uh, use a combination of a rexes and the scissors. So if it's possible, as far as possible, use your forceps or your uh, cystitone to make a rexes. The moment you encounter a fibrous capsule, then you change over to scissors. Use your scissors to cut these fibrous bands release these fibrous bands, and then again, you can continue with your rexus. So in this, basically, you'll have to use a combination of the forceps and your scissors.
and wherever you have this fibrous band you use your scissors to cut this fibrous band to achieve your capsular rexus never pull on to the fibrous bands as you may lead uh, this may lead to zonular dialysis uh hypermature morganian cataracts uh, there a lot of leakage of the milky fluid so you need to aspirate this fluid once you get this you aspirate the fluid and then you can continue with your capsular rexus the aspiration of the fluid uh, gives you a clear uh, field of view and if you don't aspirate it as you can see at this point of time there's a lot of milky fluid coming obscuring your view so once you don't compromise with obscured view work in a clear view so uh, basically with the increase in the number of cases of white cataracts uh, there's been a lot of increase in white cataracts good capsular rexus should be the goal use good and liberal viscoelastic and of course use trap and blue thank you very much for your attention thank you dr shetrapal for this wonderful presentation uh, it's indeed a nightmare for surgeons at times when they see these swollen lenses white cataracts but uh, apart from the uh, ferrari in your ot which you mentioned as the uh, femto you also have the option of using a zepto at times which might be a bugatti not a ferrari <laughs> and uh, that does a good job as well anybody here with an experience on the zepto Dr. Suresh has a good experience on Zepto. He's using one of them. Yes, I have used. Uh, I'm using Zepto uh, uh, nanopulse technology, and it's a good uh, tool uh, in case of white cataract or white intubation cataract. And uh, it's wonderful, uh, uh, you know, to do the rexis, Zepto rexis, and uh, especially in cases where you want to implant the premium lenses. The only limitation of the Zepto device is that uh, the first uh, you have to insert inside the entry chamber, and secondly, uh, its cost. Its cost is um, like approximately eight thousand rupees, which is prohibitive for uh, many surgeons to do it uh, in each and every case of white cataract. I agree, Dr. Suresh. You are quite right. Uh, anybody else using Zepto? The limitations anybody could highlight. i am also using i had encountered one or two problems in some of the patients where the suction was not that much proper and actually the capsule rexis run away so that is uh, it's not that it is always 100% safe sometimes it can create problem and dr suresh pandey told about the price recently they have again hiked the price so spending so much in one patient like 15 uh, 16000 one has to weigh whether you can go ahead without in using the Uh, Jepto, or you can use your technique as described by Dr. Arun Chaturpal. You also have to keep in mind not only the cost of the probe, you also have to keep in mind the initial investment of the machine itself. But yeah. then, it's, uh, other than a Ferrari, you got a Bugatti, so it's it's fine. Uh, uh, Dr. Arun, a couple of techniques which you missed out. I mean, apart from yeah. the exit one that you've shown is, you know, doing two-step uh, capsular excess, one a small one and then a large one. Another one interesting case, uh, a technique I would say, not a case, is that you can have your uh, 24 gauge needle tapped on to your aspiration line on your phaco and then you can directly punch in and you know aspirate things uh, yes. quite a few surgeons also talk about the punch or excess that using punch. a phaco directly punching on to the uh, capsule dr professor titial uh, could you please once you're here uh, highlight and give us some pearls of wisdom on this so you're muted yeah most of the things are nicely covered like the gamut of uh, white cataract you go as you go through the uh, spectrum of white cataracts you have to you know devise your own ways to handle those uh, different uh, you know spectrum of white cataracts it can range from uh, you know as you sold uh, totally fluid cataract like hypermature morganian type to a uh, intumescent cataract which may have a totally uh, hydrated cortex with a fluid pocket inside those hydrated fibers and those cases are one which are very difficult to manage because you can't really decrease the pressure despite you know 
making a nick in those cases. Aspiration may also not help in such cases. There, I think what uh, Rajiv was talking about, double rexis type of thing works out in those cases. Do a small rexis first, aspirate the hydrated cortex, then do a second, uh, you know, spiraling of a rexis. And those type of techniques we all understand uh, decreases the rexis extension to periphery, making a small uh, rexis or opening first. One technique which recently published by our uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Rajinder Prasad, where he does a multi, uh, you know, micro punctures, like a uh, swing needle swing type needle. of uh, this thing. And that also works out. That doesn't allow the tear to extend to periphery in a very rapid manner. But uh, we do understand there are some cases, where whatever you do, immediately rexes go to periphery because those are a very, very uh, intensely, you know, raised internal ventricular pressure. One first nick touch, you might put needle 26 gauge or 28 gauge, do a punch or axis, whatever you do in those cases, it goes to periphery immediately because there's so much of pressure from behind. Such cases has to be seen uh, initially with a good examination under slit lamp or an anterior OCT, which will tell you that it's not a fluid, it is a hydrated cortex which is bulging. And uh, maybe uh, to begin with, uh, you might give a, a, a mannitol in some cases to decrease the vitreous volume, or some patient may uh, do well with the, you know, uh, block yeah. and super pinky for some time. That also helps in these cases. Other eye examination is also very classically important in these cases because small eye, shallow chamber, uh, uh, ladies, uh, very small aperture. So those cases, you have to be a little careful uh, dealing with these cases. I think uh, some of the panelists have uh, interest in commenting uh, one by one. Uh, uh, Dr. Dhami, you want to say yeah, uh, actually, Dr. Tatyal has already mentioned, I think a preoperative interior segment OCT is must in these cases. That will define the fluid spaces in the capsular bag. You can easily guess what you're going to do. If the fluid spaces are many, you can easily aspirate, decompress, and then do a rexis. If it's a pure white milky cataract, you can go ahead with a good viscoelastic so it virtually divides your white cataract into a classification, what it is. And it will be easier to pursue. Otherwise, Dr. Arun, we have shown very good techniques. And especially when you mention about the initial nick, initial nick has never to be vertical or horizontal. It has to be a C. C. Once you make a C, it will never go beyond that. Then you can proceed. Thank you. It has to be slightly curved rather than a straight nick. Yeah. So quite, quite nicely put it. I mean, those wonderful tips about making a C. Uh, but, but does the OCT give you an indication that uh, this case might be a candidate for a and flag sign or if there's any other indicator or investigation you can do? Yes, it does. It does. Definitely. We have already, I think Dr. Tetyal has published many. We do have a publication where we really can show these spaces proceed according to the classification of the cataract. And Dr. if if there are too many fluid spaces, you can easily aspirate, decompress, and go ahead with the normal rexes. Perfect, Dr. Dhami. Dr. Subhash Prasad, uh, Dr. Saurabh Patwardhan, as well as Arun wanted to say something, one by one, please. Yeah, uh, may I add? Yeah, sure, please. Yeah, so I think, uh, of course, most of the points are have been told. Uh, I think one thing which have changed uh, my experience, like I have had Argentine flag for last, I think, three, four years was the introduction of Hylu coat. Uh, the composition is similar to Viscoat. It is by a contact care company, but it is very viscous. It's almost five to 10 times viscous. And you cannot inject it through, uh, using 27 gauge needle, unlike uh, Viscoat. Uh, so it indicates that it cannot come out easily from the side ports as well. So I think using that, uh, I have almost, uh, I would say eliminated the Argentinian flags and even in the toughest of cases, which are young cataracts with, uh, you know, tense uh, uh, elastic sclera, even in pediatric intumescent cataract I have used and uh, there is no Argentinian flag. I think that made a huge difference in my pet practice. So I think uh, anyone who has used uh, this uh, device uh, can uh, add the comment. It makes sense to use high molecular weight. No, no, I'm also uh, following the same, the sort of what you said, I'm following the same and also have very good results. Yeah. 
so high viscosity high molecular weight uh, ingredients as viscoelastic might help so that's that's one takeaway yeah i i think one of the common mistake that uh, maybe i did or many surgeons do is that they over inflate the anterior chamber while doing the intumescent care. and it's so uh, actually counterproductive which i have seen in one of the videos even in normal cases if you over inflate the capsule axis may go out so uh, with high molecular weight heavy viscoelastic you actually don't over inflate the anterior chamber but keep it as it is but it puts a weight on the anterior capsule which eliminates the chances of uh, argentinian flag so basically you have i'll to counterbalance the intral lenticular pressure with the, uh, with, with the weight capsule. with the yes. weight and That's not the yeah, pressure not over inflate so yeah. those are perfectly very sensible and uh, suggestions i think we'll have to move on because of shortage of time we we'll definitely come back in the end so we now have subhash prasad from patna he'll be talking to us about another complication that we do face when we have a pc tear and how to actually uh, place an io in those cases dr subhash please uh, there was some change in topic rajiv uh, so good evening uh, my deepest regard to my teacher and my idol actually professor titial sir and i am so delighted to share the session with you so i would be speaking on uh, phaco in pre existing capsule order axis uh, pc tear actually we all know that the pre existing pc defect is very challenging because of lot of intraoperative complications like uh, posterior capsule rent leading to nucleus drop then vitreous prolapse and many times we have very limited choice of ials we have to compromise with the intraocular lenses also so what are the conditions where we get uh, these uh, Pre existing capsule rent. Uh, many of us have uh, nowadays they, they, we get posterior polar cataract, but that is separate entity. I won't discuss that. Some of the congenital cataract can have pre existing defect. Uh, many times we get trauma, particularly the open globe injury, and not only that, open globe, even in the closed globe injury, we have some patient who have uh, actually pre existing PC tear. And nowadays, the a uh, lot of uh, patients are getting intraventricular injections. We see a lot of patients. Having posterior capsule touch or tear because of the intravitreal injection, and not and not to forget that pass plan of procedure like vitrectomy sometimes can have touch in the posterior capsule with the vitreous cutter, and it can lead to cataract with the posterior capsule tear. This is one of the posterior lenticular cataract. These patients are very prone to have defect, uh, have tear during the surgery and complications. Uh, some of the clinical pictures of the patients who received actually injections. The last year, the slides are not moving. You know, can you go to slide show? Uh, it's not moving, sir. Yeah. It's not moving. Bottom. Yeah, yes, uh, slide show, please. Press slide show. In the bottom, the right, bottom right. Or you can do a unshare and share again. Moving now. Ah, slide show again. Slide show. Is it visible now? Ek baar un un share it and and share it again. Okay, okay. Slide show. Is it visible? It is slide show. Not Can visible. Can you uh, uh, just press the slide show? Yes, sir. Sorry. Slide, slide show. show. Slide show. Bottom right. It's showing that it's moving here. No, press slide show. Don't move it before moving. Go yes. to slide show. Yes, sir. yes, yes. Yes, sir. 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 You yeah, it's double click on that. Yeah, it's full full screen actually. Okay, so it's not coming. It doesn't matter. You go with this only. You change the slide now. Go to next slide. So, uh, is something there visible or not, sir, on the screen? Ah, it is visible. Care. It is visible, yeah. but maybe you might have some issue on your videos if you play. So, take care about it. Okay. So, uh, this is one of the uh, patients who had uh, blunt uh, actually blunt injury and had large posterior capsule tear. so what are the clinical uh, features the many of the patients who actually present with the rapid onset of cataract particularly those with trauma or any patients who received intravitreal injections or any patient who had under, undergone vitreous surgery slit lamp examination is very much uh, actually confirmatory if the cataract is not that dense and one can see the posterior capsule defect 
other clinical signs uh, of the posterior capsule defect are like crystal signs, white demarcation line or white crystalline particles floating in the vitreous. If the catheter is very dense enough, uh, one has to take the help of UBM or the routine B scan. Or just to demonstrate to the patient, one can do the entry segment OCT and simplex imaging just to convince the patient that you have this much of problem and uh, you can land up with the uh, various uh, other complications during the surgery. So uh, proper counseling of these patients are very important beforehand. You have to tell all the complications and the possible change in the methodology or the change in the procedures. And one should uh, consider doing the cataract surgery when it is visually significant. Since there are increased risk of... Sorry. There is increased risk of nucleus drop during the surgery. One should do the surgery under perivalvular anesthesia. And these cases should be treated as we do in the posterior polar cataract. And always keep in mind that one has to uh, follow the dictum of low parameter, low bottle height. If, if, if the machine is not uh, uh, actually active fluidics, one has to use the low bottle height. There should not be any hydro dissection. There should not be any nucleus rotation. Rather, one should do hydro delineation. And one should have good vitrectomy machine uh, also as, as a standby because you are going to have vitreous prolapse in these patients. And backup three-piece IOLs should be there. These are the clinical picture of one of the patient who received eccentrics uh, for BRVO and developed this cataract. Uh, the entire segment OCT is showing some defect here. And the simplug imaging, the serious topography is also showing some defect. So this is the small video clip of the same patients. Uh, you can see Subhash, the large... Subhash, we really can't see the video, neither are your slides moving. Uh, we are still on that uh, second slide, I guess, post really? Yes, post injection, mm -hmm. intravitreal injection. No new slides visible now? The slide visible. is visible, but you are on your probably second slide now, second or third slide. So I will just minimize. Can I go with the. This, this is better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Please, please play. So this is the video of the same patient who has actually received eccentric injection. Uh, luckily, the patient was little young, 40 years of age. So uh, the catheter was soft. So I did the hydro delineation here and then using the bimanual irrigation as patient, I was able to remove most of the cortical part actually. There was no dense nucleus, but at the end, uh, there was a vitreous prolapse. So the dictum is that never allow the chamber to uh, sell. So I used the uh, viscoelastic uh, before taking out the irrigation port and I'm doing the vitrectomy. One can use the uh, actually limbal root also to do the vitrectomy, but uh, going through the pass plan actually ensures that you take out all the cortex uh, meticulously and you don't leave anything there so that uh, you, uh, resorting to that technique is better and always use three pieces, multi-piece IOL. In this patient, never try to use any single piece lens in the sulcus. And I am tucking the haptic of the IOL so that there is entry optic capture at the end. And don't forget to check the entry chamber whether the vitreous is clear or not. Uh, again, I'm checking out, out whether there is any vitreous left in the entry chamber or not, and then taking out the port. Uh, this is another case where the patient received Ojudex injection and developed a traumatic cataract. Uh, again, this, uh, video of the, the patient. Uh, the cataract was here little uh, hard. It was not very soft. So uh, here just doing the irrigation as vision was not going to be enough. So I, I just uh, followed that uh, go slowly and use the low parameter. But uh, again, at the end of the uh, taking, while I was trying to take out the near the last piece, uh, there was uh, uh, giving away of the posterior capsule with the vitreous in the entry chamber. And since the piece was very small left over, so I just plugged the posterior capsule end with a escort and then tried to remove the nucleus to the same port. Uh, had it been a bigger nuclear fragment, I would have probably have used the, uh, using the, the uh, using the IOL as the actually the sca scaffold, but here it was not necessary. So again, did the vitrectomy and removing the, all the cortex from the bag and uh, from everywhere, just to ensure that nothing is left behind. And I'll use again three piece lenses here. It's very important that you always use tramcellulone acetonide so that there's no vitreous 
uh, anywhere in the atria wound or in the wound or in the atria chamber. And tucking or capturing the IOL is very important. Some of the uh, ophthalmologists actually they don't have backup lenses of three patients. They tend to use the single piece lenses. That is not advisable actually in these patients. Coming to one of the patients with who had traumatic cataract, traumatic big posterior capsule defect. Uh, here again, the it was very soft, softer one. So trying to stem the capsule and then doing the capsule axis, it was not difficult. But uh, while taking out the cortex, actually. Uh, there was huge gap in the posterior capsule. I will just move fast. I'm doing the cortical aspiration with the bimanual eye. And again, I have to do the vitectomy here. Uh, I'm using the same technique of going through the pass plana. That is my preferred way of doing vitectomy. But any uh, anyone who is not that much confident or conversant with the pass plana approach, always go through the limbal route, but the, what is more important is that you ensure that you take out all the vitreous and never leave any vitreous into the anterior chamber or into the wound. And, and it is very, uh, very much helpful to, uh, to do the posterior uh, pass plana vitreous cutter, uh, which can help you actually in taking out e each and every bit of the cortex. Here again, I will use the three page lenses moving ahead with the uh, another case, in the same case that you can see the post-op picture. This was a case of uh, again a uh, 35 years old male who suffered actually a blunt injury but somehow developed a cataract like this. And he, since he had very uh, not very good vision and I suggested that it's not better to uh, wait because it can sometimes progress and become mature and it will be difficult to manage. So I motivated him to go ahead with the surgery. And here, the, since there was uh, three, uh, three diopter of astigmatism, so I suggested the patient to go for the toric IL implantation. And here, toric IL was planned. Again, following the same dictum of keeping the chamber maintained throughout, not allowing the chamber to fluctuate or not allowing uh, to collapse, always using the viscoelastic through the side port before taking out the irrigation uh, handpiece. Uh, all is very much helpful in these patients to prevent any fluctuation. You can see a big tear in the posterior capsule and I, I was able to do it without uh, letting the vitreous come into the anterior face or breaking the anterior highlight face and injecting the viscoelastic before coming out and putting the toric lens uh, in the back and then I'm rotating it into the desired axis of uh, placement, taking out the viscoelastic gently and gently without uh, uh, without making anything undue movement or undue fluctuation of the anterior chamber and then finally putting it in the place of desired meridian and uh, the result was very much uh, very good in this patient i'm hydrating before taking out the irrigation you can see that i'm using the uh, swab stick even in the port uh, over the port from where i am taking out the irrigation handpiece so that there is no uh, the, even there is no little bit of fluctuation of the anterior chamber. That is very important to ensure that there is no vitreous into the vitreous coming out into the interior, anterior chamber. This is the pre-op picture and this is the post-op picture of the same patient. So just to summarize, pre-existing <coughs> tissue tear can occur in, in, in some of the certain situations and we can uh, encounter these patients in our day-to-day -day practice. And there is always a rise in incidence of traumatic cataract these days because of use of rampant use of, in, rampant use of intravital anti vagab injection, which is being given by right and left by all ophthalmologists. Even those ophthalmologists who are not giving intravital anti injection for endophthalmitis are now resorting to anti vagab So this can lead to increased number of traumatic cataract. And one needs careful pre-operative evaluation before taking up these cases and uh, meticulous planning and uh, patient surgical approach actually can give a very good outcome. And one has to treat this patient as the as we treat, treat in the posterior polar cataract. So thank you very much. Wonderful, Dr. Subhash. That was a classic example of a very competent and uh, skilled vitreoretinal surgeon uh, tackling these difficult cases. With the paucity of time, I will uh, skip the questions this time. My apologies. And we'll move on to Dr. Thami who's a very renowned cataract surgeon, and he'll be talking to us about, oops, it could have been prevented. Dr. Dhami, please. Oh, yeah, I'm sharing my screen, please. Yeah, we can see your screen. Uh, yeah. 
uh, the presentation is coming up anyway to begin with it's uh, light show a please. little uh, it's it's a little mood of happiness when you are about to finish your case but suddenly you see that something is happening and that is happening because you are over confident or your mind divided or it had to happen let's see what all can happen yes but all these mistakes could be prevented or avoided if we could just not share our mind somewhere else while operating this is the first case where the zonodiasis occurred because of excessive manipulation with the iol a wonderful surgery done but suddenly when you are using the insertion of the iol an extra force creates a problem for us maybe the injector was forcefully pushed in or we were in a hurry so such but manipulation of these cases is very important a well done case now the pearls of learning in this case is we should be very sure that we don't empty the bag while pushing in the lens we could should we should refill the bag with visco elastic try putting a ctr if this is on nodalsis rotate the aisle back rotate the aisle with the bag filled with visco elastic away from the area of zonodiasis there should be minimum manipulation always away from the area of dialysis it could have been prevented had we have taken care a little extra not finishing fast in the case second case now this is what really happens once you have done a very good surgery a perfect ccc grade 3 cataract easily fecoded then where did we go wrong we have filled the bag with visco elastic it's a toric iol no it's a plano air but see what happens the whole visco elastic has leaked through the side port and there are attractions in the posterior capsule if we try to push the lens in we will land the lens into the vitreous at this time it is better to refill the bag with visco elastic and then rotate or land the lens in the sulcus and fill in the bag and take care that it is well centered after that a little taking care saves you of making a rent in the posterior chamber
Pipals are avoid manipulation from the side port. Refill the bag with the AC with the or with the irrigating fluid, which is more you know more helping to take the lens into the bag, and use a dispersive OVD. Probably the cohesive is viscoelastic come out very fast. Next case. That's one of our resident operating. Just note the PC rent. When noticed at the right time, the whole nucleus can be saved from dropping in. Fill in the gap with a good viscoelastic. Place a scaffold in in the bag, on the bag, preferably in the sulcus. Let all the fragments come over the scaffold and we can do a safe manipulation and a soft FACO emulsification with low power and everything. And we have done a good case without any complication. Check all the wounds. They should not be leaking so that no vitreous is entrapped into the section or vitreous bands into the section. So the learning are early recognition of the capsular rent is of more importance and the only point to save your surgery at this point. And believe me, all ground staff looking at the videos should be counseled and made to understand when the PC rent occurs, whenever a fellow is operating, and of course you are operating. To rescue, remove, removal of all the remaining nuclear fragments is very important. IL scaffold is a big and a very important technique to save yourself. An interior capsule should be complete for optic capture. A very nicely done surgery. Now, what we are trying to is we put a toric IOL. Now, these new toric IOLs have a roughened area on their haptics, especially to prevent rotation. See what it creates here. When you try to rotate, you lose your zonules. There is a PC rent where you're trying to scrape a hydrophobic IOL onto the posterior capsule, which is now pretty moistened or wet with the viscoelastic and it creates a rent. But we were lucky and safe to place the toric lens as aligned as expected with good results.
the poles are what longer cornea tunnels in small white to white that creates that is why that is where when you can't see the trailing edge and you keep pushing and make rate as zonule dialysis or a pc rent on the opposite side always watch the trailing haptes in the sulcus it is very important when you're going to rotate because you're going to lose the balance while rotating the leading haptic do not rotate the haptic but just push it be careful of hydrophobic oil materials it damages the pusse capsule and the zonules quite frequently in a very well done case things go wrong so that you appreciate them when they are right always be careful and never be over confident till you have finished the last case thank you excellent dr nami and uh, these were points that we should all remember that uh, we should keep our head calm be attentive at all times during surgery have our steps and protocols in place and uh, excellent scaffold technique one little comment i'd like to make uh, is that if you are suspecting vitreous it should be go to as a teaching to everybody that put in transonal nitrate to see if there is any vitreous strand so that you are very sure yeah. that the vitreous are no vitreous rather than fish, fishing over there oh yes i'd move on to the next topic which is again by a prolific cataract surgeon and a wonderful very well accomplished dr purendra basin who's going to talk to us about how to proceed with cataract surgery in post radic keratotomy eyes you are muted you are muted thank you dr tityal sir uh, can you see my uh, screen please dr ajit i can see your screen your ppt is not yet open uh, no it is not working i will just see you will have to share the ppt not the folder okay stop sharing first unshare this yeah yeah thank you dr tityal sir dr uh, rajesh and uh, dr rajiv for giving me this opportunity cataract surgery issues in post rkis i have no financial interest dr basin you need to share your ppt so still, still not go you to share your ppt uh uh one second i have to come out of it is it visible now the folder is visible you have shared the folder again you need to open the oh. ppt and share the ppt not the folder oh. you have to share the powerpoint presentation mm -hmm. is it visible now no no, no. no. okay one thing now is it visible no it's not is sharad babu there and his presentation ready dr sharad babu yes yeah. is your presentation ready yes uh, dr basin would you mind if i move on to dr sharad in the meantime you can fix up yeah yeah please thank you so much dr sharad am i visible am i visible you are you are you are you can see yeah thanks tital sahab and uh, rajesh and rajiv so i will be dealing with uh, two simple cases which you encounter routinely in your practice and uh, <clears throat> so this is the posterior uh, 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 capsular cataract so as usual the incision i do a, a mid limbal or a, a incision so whenever you do a uh faco surgery in these patients do a lamellar hydro dissection don't do uh, the posterior capsule be careful and uh, <clears throat> here in this patient 
I do. I started doing a normal FACO. The with the the intraocular pressure is around 50 50 millimeters in this patient, and then uh, I started uh, after the cataract uh, removal. I started doing the uh, aspiration, and there slightly I could see that uh, there is a small rent or uh, the capsular defect. I could see in this area, in this area. In this area, yeah, yeah. So I stopped, stopped, stopped because it's just only a defect I could see. So I stopped and then filled with the visco. And whenever I do this, I usually I use a methyl cellulose for uh, all my cataract surgeries. And in this patient, I use a sodium hydrate one percent because I saw the defect. <laughs> Now I switched over to the bimanual irrigation aspiration in this patient. So in the bimanual irrigation aspiration, I tried to start, I started uh, uh, aspiration in this patient and uh, be sure that always there is a irrigation port inside the eye. Now I, uh, with the bimanual irrigation, I'm very safe inside. I could uh, aspirate the cortex, cortical matter. I could uh, take out the um, matter very clearly and then I could still see the capsular defect here still there there is no vitreous disturbance in this patient so I couldn't remove the the, uh, the cortex from this side so don't remove the irrigation port now fill the antechamber with the sodium hydrate, see that the AC is formed. You can see the longitudinal defect there. Then exchange the irrigation and the aspiration on the other side. And there is no vitreous disturbance because of our irrigation aspiration doing bimanually. So now I aspirate the from the other side. Take out the cortex. There is no stress disturbance. Take out the whole cortex. Never leave behind any cortex because that may lead into uveitis and glaucoma postoperatively. Try to aspirate completely whatever the cortex is there. Yes. You can see very clearly the longitudinal defect, post capsule defect. Now I'm putting a three-piece eye oil in the sulcus. Rotate it, the eye oil, into the sulcus. and then tap the optic into the bag behind the capsular axis. So the take home message is be prepared, don't panic. Whenever there is a posterior polar cataract, do a hydro dissection, lamellar hydro dissection. And also uh, whenever you are doing, there is, when you see a posterior capsular defect, uh, be sure <laughs> that uh, uh, the AC is always filled either with the visco or with the BSS, what you are using. And then use a, a higher viscoelastic, that is the sodium hydrate I use commonly whenever such cases happen. But see that the whole of the cortex is aspirated completely. And if there is no vitreous disturbance, no vitrectomy done. And postoperatively, uh, intraoperatively, in the last, I use a little bit of pilocarpine, intracameral pilocarpine, so that the pupil uh, becomes small. And then they hydrate the wound and uh, uh, the surgery is done. And then this is the second case which I am uh, operating. This is the simple uh, iris clip lens which I have been showing you. There is a iris, uh, there is a lens dislocation almost uh, more than three-fourths into the antechamber and this patient was 
because of the uh, lens induced glaucoma they are, it was already uh, iagiratomy was done elsewhere so when the patient came to me with the high intraocular pressure i have done a i have given mannitol for this patient and i planned for sics with the iris clip iv so the routine incision 5 mm incision i have done with 11 number blade and then <clears throat> and then with the scleral splitting with the blade tunneling use visco elastic here also my preference is sodium hydrate 1% in this patient and then with the vectix i remove the the whole lens it is very easy because it's almost the zonular dexens is almost all around i use pilocarpin in this patient to constrict the pupil because there is no vitreous disturbance then the iris clip i will is been introduced into the anterior chamber so holding the holding the uh, optic with the dialer the small lick on one side and on the other side again holding the optic i do a implantation posterior chamber meaning of stationary not moving or not so because there is already a yag gyratomy done in this patient so i am suturing the wound with this air bubble which i take out the air bubble after the surgery thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and any questions yeah sir that was indeed a fantastic demonstration of difficult cases uh, posterior polar cataract and uh, iris clip lens due to shortage of time again my sincere apologies we'll go forward to another presentation which is uh, by dr pasin and uh, i look forward to his talk on uh, radial keratotomy and cataract surgery dr pasin over to you slide show please it's working fine thank you at, at the outset i would like to thank dr professor titial and uh, what not moving uh -huh. not moving pause for a minute take any No, it's good to keep it. Mm -hmm. So, the, since um, during 1980s and 90s, there were um, radial keratotomy was the most established te technique to eliminate the need for spectacle. And uh, these patients are now developing uh, cataract and they are coming to us for the cataract surgery. And uh, there are various issues associated with this uh, man uh, in managing these kind of cataracts. Like uh, first is the calculation of the IL power can be inaccurate, which we'll be discussing shortly. And uh, during the surgery, the RK incisions can create a challenge and can rip open during the surgery. The post-operative recovery can be prolonged. And uh, these patients are really intolerant because they are having very high expectations because they have undergone uh, the the LASIK uh, RK surgery before with good results. So uh, various uh, uh, error which occur due to uh, in calculation of the IL power is basically due to the keratometric error in uh, in measuring it. So RK, what happens is it flattens the central 
uh, zone and which is present in both anterior and posterior optical zone and this zone is very very small and uh, this is less than the size of the zone which we uh, measure by our routine keratometers which is around 3.2 millimeter and this zone is around 2 millimeter zone so uh, that way the keratometry is uh, inaccurate which we take into consideration for the il power calculation secondly uh, the there is a difference between the uh, uh, the there is a physiological disruption of the anterior and posterior corneal curvature ratio and we are using the same keratometric index of 1.3375 which uh, is which goes wrong in il power calculation and this is more in cases of uh, post prk or post lasik as compared to the rk because rk most likely flattens both anterior and posterior uh, corneal surface symmetrically there is an overestimation of il uh, overestimation of the corneal power or keratometry reading which results in implantation of a lower power iul and there is a post op hyperopia so what we recommend is to do a multiple times keratometry reading with varying uh, diagnostic devices such as pentacam or galilee dual sham flow analyzer which takes into consideration both anterior and posterior corneal surfaces and to help prevent post operative hyperopia or more myopic result is to be targeted which is equivalent to 0 minus 0.75 diopter instead of minus 0.25 diopters and i avoid toric lenses in uh, some cases which are post rk with multiple incision and with when the scarring is more at one particular incision or there is a gap so in such cases because it is rare to have a regular astigmatism in these eyes so we should avoid toric lenses sir anything so uh, and uh, we should use il power calculation now in the most of the uh, newer generation uh, uh, il power calculation uh, the biometers we have a il power calculation for the post rk eyes and post lasik eyes and if you don't have those uh, biometers we can use uh, uh, ascrs or uh, escrs uh, website where we can calculate the il power in such cases the power of cornea is combination of anterior and post uh, corneal power and the posterior corneal power Maloney has suggested if you don't have those biometers that uh, we can have an estimated corneal power by uh, with central corneal power on topography can be taken into consideration and then the, with using this formula uh, we can calculate the corneal power and then that, that can be used coming to the surgical consideration the arc incisions are weak and are prone to open during the surgery so cataract surgery incision must avoid intersecting the existing arc incisions as they can unzip and cause excessive fluid leakage during the surgery so with 16 or more arc cuts i make a scleral tunnel cataract incision as it becomes difficult to avoid the existing arc incision to uh, intersect or by, to, to avoid them so it is preferred to use a smaller phaco needle 1.8 or 2.2 mm and lower flow and lower bottle height to ensure safe surgery procedure this is uh, the first case as you can see uh, through the side port these are longer eyes and uh, we have to uh, anesthetize them and use intraocular intracameral uh, oculan or and uh, then uh, i am using a collar here you can see of sclera it is there and uh, after dissecting the conjunctiva we are going a making a scleral tunnel and this collar of sclera will pr protect us or prevent this incisions to go and uh, open up and safely by by less maneuver uh, maneuveration and uh, less trauma to the cornea we can safely perform the uh, phaco emulsification in eyes with multiple incisions as you can see here there were multiple incision there was no space left in between otherwise if you have enough space of 2.8 mm or 3 mm then you can go in through in between 
the incisions. As you can see in this particular case, the incision were uh, around eight or 10. And uh, we have made our opening. Um, main incision is created in between the two incisions of the RK. And uh, mind it that uh, our side to side maneuvering and uh, a push and pull technique should be avoided. We should be very, very stable and we should more work more in a longitudinal fashion. Then going on either side and this is how it is done. It has been said that uh, uh, doing a, a post RK eyes with the, the femtosecond laser can lead to the incomplete capsule axis because at the site of the RK incision, the, the laser will not work and the chances, but definitely newer uh, lasers are better and uh, we should be careful while uh, doing uh, removing the anterior capsule after the capsule axis is done by femtosecond laser. As in this particular case, it is round, regular, and we had no problem in uh, doing this. Uh, Dr. Pritial must be having better experience of managing such cases with the femtosecond laser. And here again, we have used a scleral tunnel instead of uh, going through the corneal incision. And uh, this has prevented us from... So uh, this is the last case, which I will be showing with a 48 years old female, post RKI, anterior segment with the normal limit, fundus myopic, and in the right eye, PCI has been done eight months before uh, back so at some other place. And the residual refractive error is plus 8.5 diopters with three and a half diopter cylinder at 180 degree. So uh, there was no other choice but to go for a, a Selcofix uh, uh, IOL or piggyback IOL of 12 and a half diopters in this particular case. And postoperatively, after one month, patient still had a one and a half diopters but she was correcting, improving to 6.9. This is a lens uh, because piggyback sulcoflex lenses are not available freely. This is I mean, this patient had a multiple incision, more than 16, I can see. You can see. And uh, I'm going through a scleral tunnel incision. And this is the lens which has been developed in a similar way, with the, but with four haptics. And there is a a uh, gap between the the previous lens and this particular lens because the posterior surface is concave and this is the lens which we have placed in the sulcus it goes very smoothly uh, we have to make a 2.8 millimeter incision this is made up of a hydrophilic acrylic material the only thing is that the lens design is similar to uh, the design of the Rayner sulcoflex lenses and this is how we could manage this particular case. So, and one can use intraoperative abrometry if they have and can check the IL power calculation and intraoperatively, or do one can do refraction during the uh, after, uh, during the surgery. So, postoperative considerations uh, we have to be very very careful and we have to reassure this patient. The RK incision swell during even the gentlest cataract surgery. This swelling can induce central corneal flattening further, which results in excessive hyperopia in the immediate postoperative period. So there is a fluctuation of a refractive state for many weeks after their cataract surgery. So we have to reassure this patient and some amount of initial hyperopia should not be a cause of concern. After waiting at least six weeks, depending on the number of RK incisions, if the patient is still significantly hyperopic, a second procedure can be performed. And uh, uh, LASIK is a, a big no in such cases because of chances of uh, the opening up of the, 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 the flap of the cornea. So, so I prefer single focus lens implants. I don't prefer uh, going for a multifocal or toric lenses. Aspheric IOLs are very good is a very good choice, and uh, Technis uh, the IOL gives the better uh, minus correction uh, and the, for these patients. Implanting a negative spherical abrasion 
uh, aspheric eyewell can help to offset the large amount of positive spherical aberrations often seen in these are post RK corneas and preferably technis eyewell. Multifocal eyewell should better be avoided for the reason that cornea is irregular, it is difficult to achieve absolute or near emetropia. Fluctuating refraction, refraction because it changes in the post-operative period because of the swelling of the incision, there may be a progressive hyperopic shift over time. So with this, I thank you for the patient hearing. Thank you. That was indeed fantastic, Dr. Basina. Usually your presentations are so nice. Only one little point I'd like to make is it's wise to suture these incisions once you've done a cataract surgery for RK patients. It's rather to be safe than sorry. Uh, I would like to sincerely apologize to all the uh, speakers in the last few uh, presentations, as well as our audience, uh, that we could not take up too many questions as we got very late. I will request our president, Dr. Professor Titial, to give some uh, words of advice to us. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, I think uh, all the speakers, you know, done a wonderful job. We have learned so many tricks, you know, of managing these difficult cases. I think, uh, though we didn't have a discussion, but their presentation was almost complete. You know, uh, if you look into a, a presentation, RK presentation, everything was covered, and uh, posterior capsule problems, uh, Dr. Sarath covered so nicely. And uh, Dr. Dami is an expert in all the fields. And all these presentations are, in fact, complete, you know. And uh, I'm uh, very happy that uh, it was uh, one of the, I think, amongst the cattle sessions, one of the best sessions today. Like, we covered almost everything in you know, difficult situations. And I'd like to thank all of you, and especially Rajiv, for uh, doing a, such a wonderful moderation. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, and I must uh, thank each one of you for being here and joining Iskaris uh, web national webinar today on uh, difficult cataract surgery situations. And uh, we we'll, uh, look forward to having you all over uh, with us again next Friday, which is the Iskaris Day, on another wonderful presentation that we're going to bring on with the faculty. At the end, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Ipka, uh, Mr. Anil Kumar, uh, and Dr. Bageshwar, and the, uh, Mr. Bageshwar and the IT team for putting up uh, a wonderful support behind us. Thank you all. Have a very good night. Uh, hope to see you very soon. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Hello. Good night to all of you. Good night. <laughs> good night. Keep, safe. Good night. Keep safe. Keep safe. Are we offline? Admin? He's offline. Admin? Off over here. So, off over here. Okay, see you guys anyway. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. 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 Good night.